living in two wings of the country, West and East Pakistan, separated from each other by 1,200 miles. East Pakistan is mostly flat, no more than 30 feet above sea level. The most significant feature is its network of rivers, large and small, and a wide distribution of lakes, swamps and marshes. The climate is wet and moderate. West Pakistan's climate is very different, on the whole arid and extreme. Much of West Pakistan is several hundred feet above sea level and some distance from the sea. Not surprisingly, the people too are different. The Baluchis and the Pathans from the mountain areas and the Punjabis and Sindhis in the plains. Not far from Ralpindi, a new national capital is being built in very modern style. Its name, Islamabad, reflects the country's origins and aspirations. For it is the great cultural and religious force of Islam that unites the peoples of Pakistan into one nation. It also links West Pakistan with the peoples of the Middle East and the Arab countries of North Africa, East Pakistan with the independent Asian states of Malaysia and Indonesia. The great majority of Pakistanis are Muslim. Their ways of life are based on the beliefs and customs of Islam. The Bad Shahi Mosque in Lahore is the largest in the world, a venue for the faithful and the tourist. In the summer, the stone of the great courtyard is so hot that mats are laid to protect their unshod feet. The architecture and decoration are characteristic of the pomp and splendor in which the Mughal emperors ruled for a thousand years and brought almost the whole of the subcontinent under their domain. The nearby Shalimar Gardens, built by the Emperor Shah Jahan in 1641, are a beautiful example of Mughal landscape architecture. Three terrace levels facilitate the flow of water to all parts of the garden from a central waterway, symbolizing the importance of water in the past, in the present, and for the future of West Pakistan. At Mohenjo-daro, literally the mound of the dead, Excavations have revealed a civilization of 5,000 years ago. Wide streets, two-story houses and big public baths show that life was better then than for many of the villagers in the same region today. But for some reason, the wells dried up. West Pakistan can be divided very simply into three physical regions. The mountains, to the north and west, the Thal Desert on the eastern border with India, and the major portion, the plain drained by the river Indus and its tributaries. Its northern part was once known as the Punjab. Lahore is Pakistan's second largest city, a major road and rail junction and the hub of internal trade for the whole of West Pakistan. Since Mughal times, it has been the cultural and educational center of the Punjab. And the old fort, built by Akbar the Great 400 years ago, at the height of the Mughal Empire, contains many mosaic tiles and murals that have withstood the ravages of time. Lahore is not only a great industrial and commercial city, but a center for the cottage industries pottery, gold, silver, lace and ornaments. The making of mud bricks is a craft that's been going on in the same manner for thousands of years. The soil of the Punjab, an alluvium of clay and sand with a high content of chalk and little organic matter, lends itself to the manufacture of bricks. 
After drying in the sun, the bricks are stacked into kilns and are then fired with charcoal and small coal. The people in this part of West Pakistan live in large villages with their mud brick houses packed closely together. Security and the shortage of water encourage settlement in concentrated groups and division of labor led to the establishment of village traders like the greengrocer, and their hides made into leather. Every farmer owns a team of bullocks or buffalo to help him till the fields, thrash the crops, or turn the charas or Persian wheels to irrigate his land. Agriculture is the major occupation of the people of Pakistan, providing food for her growing population raw materials for the principal industries, and employment for two-thirds of her people. In West Pakistan, with large seasonal variations of temperature, wheat is the most important food crop. Sugar cane is grown on irrigated land. Vegetable crops, like ladies' fingers and pulses, are also widespread. These, with rice, maize and millet, are rubby crops, harvested in October or November. Cotton, too, the chief cash crop of West Pakistan, grown mainly in the canal irrigated areas of the Indus Valley, is a rubby crop. Wheat, barley, grain and oil seeds, the kharif crops, are sown in autumn and harvested in the spring. Chipatis, made of wheat flour, are always eaten with the main meal of the day. Millet and pulses form the diet of the poorer people. From April to September, it's very hot in the plains. Perhaps 40 degrees centigrade in June. Trees shed their leaves to avoid loss of moisture. And a hot, dry wind blows throughout the day. Rivers, streams and canals dry up. The earth cracks, baked in the heat of the sun.
Mangla Dam, one of the largest earth-filled dams in the world across the Jhelum River, is the latest development in the Indus Waters project to divide the irrigation waters of the Indus and its five tributaries between India and West Pakistan. In the Indus Plain, these large rivers carry plenty of water throughout the year, and the slope of the land between them is such that their water can easily be stored by dams and weirs and distributed by canals, sluices and small ditches. Lifted here and there by Persian wheels and spread over the fields to form an irrigated area as big as Florida or Portugal or the whole of England. Sometimes it's a problem of not too little water, but too much. Water from unlined canals seeping into the soil, raising the water table and bringing to the surface poisonous salts. In West Pakistan, a fifth of the irrigated area has already been affected by waterlogging and salinity. The problem is being tackled in a massive program of tube well drilling to extract the water from the subsoil and pump it out over the topsoil, so washing the salts away. This land is fertile, and when water, controlled water, can be made available, it yields good crops. But there's little rainfall in West Pakistan. Its water must come from the hills. The Himalayas, meaning in Sanskrit, the abode of snow, stretch in a bow for 1,500 miles across the subcontinent and contain some of the highest mountain peaks in the world. Below the northern mountains, in valleys such as Svat Khoistan, lie the main forest areas of West Pakistan, of evergreen coniferous trees such as deoda, spruce and fir. The wood is soft but valuable for buildings, fencing, furniture, and for the water ducts that are a feature of this region. For the rainfall here is good and well distributed. The climate too is moderate, and settlement dates back to the 5th century BC. In contrast to the Punjab, the houses are all of timber, while the people in these northern mountain areas are Pathans, tall, with fair complexions and long, pointed noses. The mountains not only intercept the winds from the Arabian Sea and cause rain, their higher peaks are covered with snow, which melts in spring and feeds the rivers like the Indus and the Sutlej that flow down through the plains. The river valleys are very beautiful, flanked by fruit orchards and walnut trees. Along the river, often flooded in the summer months, are rice fields. South of the mountains lies the salt range, two parallel ridges, and between them, an elevated fertile plain that is also rich in minerals gypsum, rock salt, and coal. Here at Atok, a bridge has been built over the narrow gorge of the Indus River, carrying the Grand Trunk Road and the Western Railway connecting Lahore with Peshawar, the largest city in the northwest frontier area. Surrounding orchards of apples, pears, plums, peaches, and apricots feed the fruit canning industries of Peshawar. An historic city with many Buddhist relics of the Gandhara period, Peshawar is significant because it commands the passes into Afghanistan and Central Asia and has been called the gateway to India and Pakistan. Ten miles to the west, along a metalled road, a pucker road, lies Jamrud, the beginning of the famous Khyber Pass.
the Khyber Agency is inhabited by Afridi tribesmen. Many still live in forts and fortified villages, and the roadside bears memorials to the many regiments that have served here in the past. The Khyber Pass is a narrow valley winding between high hills, with lofty mountains lying behind them. The road snakes up and down for 25 miles, often above an older unmetalled or kacha road, still used for caravans of pack animals. At Tokham is the frontier post separating Pakistan from another Muslim state, Afghanistan. Through this gate, and the Bolan Pass, Afghanistan gets nearly all its foreign trade. For Afghanistan is landlocked between Pakistan, Soviet Russia and Iran. On the other side of the country, across the Sindh Plain and on West Pakistan's southeast border with India, lies the Thal Desert, covered with sand deposited there by the action of the wind. It is hot and dry, and the only vegetation is poor grass scrub and stunted bushes. In 1952, natural gas was discovered at Sui to the northwest of the desert region. This gas field, one of the largest ever tapped, and fields found later in other areas, is of the greatest importance in the industrial development of Pakistan. A pipeline 347 miles long, leads to Karachi, where nearly all the factories are powered by natural gas. Karachi is the largest town in Pakistan, the chief industrial and commercial center for cement, glass, chemicals, electrical and all sorts of engineering goods, as well as textiles and timber. Karachi has a natural harbor on the Arabian Sea and is the country's principal port. East Pakistan is some 2,500 miles away by sea around the southern tip of India. 